So you've been playing with your band for a while, you've written a load of songs, the songs are pretty much finished and now you want to record them and release them to the world. You want them to sound as good as they can be, you want everybody to like them, I mean, within reason. So here is a list of things if you're about to go into recording studios that you should be thinking about, especially as a band. Number one, let's start with something simple yet a bit technical. Use fresh guitar strings. This also counts for bass and for drummers, get new heads for your drums. It sounds silly, but so many, especially younger musicians, tend to kind of miss this and just turn up with the guitars as if they've been played for a week or two weeks. I mean, when you're playing live or in a practice room, it might not make much difference. But in the studio, you can really tell. Sounds are not just brighter, but they're fuller with fresh strings. For bass, it, it might sound brighter. I mean, if you're not after the, the most bright bass tone, that's fine, but dead strings will sound dead. They will not have the character that you're looking for to jump out of the speakers at people. And also, if you're a guitarist and you're in the studio, if you've only been in the practice room doing three or four hour sessions, we might be doing eight hours a day. And if you've got any kind of rust or pits on your strings, they're going to be cutting your fingers up pretty quickly because it's going to be a large amount of playing. So get these fresh strings, get the best ones that you can afford get several packs if you can. I mean, it's like, oh, well, there's seven pounds or maybe $10 a set each or more on bass. I appreciate that. But the studio session is going to be recorded, released, and is going to live forever. So the fact that you've spent all this money on a recording studio session, but you won't pay that little bit of extra money for those strings is something that you will look back on in years gone by and go, why didn't I just do that? So trust me, get replacement skins, replacement strings, and get the best ones that you can. It's worth the investment when you look back at it. The next point is one that's missed so often, especially by first time bands who've never been in a studio before. Um, you might go to several studios to decide who's best to work with, who's got the shiny gear you like, whatever your reasons are, you pick a studio and you pick an engineer. So the second piece of advice is trust your engineer. You've decided to work with them. You've decided to pay them the money to do their job. And their job is to make you sound as good as they can. So if they're suggesting that you should do something that you've not done before, give it a go. Try not to dig your heels in and go, this is my way. Like if you turn up to a studio with, I don't know, a practice amp and they say, let's use this amp, trust them. They have your best interests at heart. I have a lot of experience with this where younger bands will want to do things a certain way because it's all they've ever known. And I understand, but when I have enough experience to go, this isn't gonna work, try this. Don't fight it, just give it a go. If you don't like it afterwards, maybe talk to the engineer about it. And that brings me on to point number three. Point number three is talk to your engineer. They're there to make the best sound for you, but to do that, you've got to talk to them. They've got to talk to you. It's got to be a two-way conversation. Um, if I record with the band wherever possible, I meet with them before the recording session and I talk to them, I go, what do you want to sound like? Who are your influences? Why do you want to sound like this if your influences are this? I mean, these are all things with legitimate answers because that way I can then in my head be going, well, they want this kind of guitar sound. They want this kind of drum sound because you guys may not know exactly how to get what it is that you want the result of. And we do, we know how to get that. If you tell us exactly what it is that you're going for, if you turn up with a certain set of equipment and go bah, with a guitar, for instance, and say you bring in a, like, a metal amp and you want to sound like Pete Townsend from The Who, it's not going to work. 
But if you tell us that, we can go, hey, if you want to sound like this guy, how about this? How about this? How about trying this? And then very quickly, you can hit that chord and go, that's the sound. That's what we're here for. We're not here to fight you. We're here to work with you. And so that at the end of the session, at the end of the week, month, however long you're in the studio for, you can go, that sounds exactly how I wanted it to in my head. The next piece of advice is specifically for drummers, especially drummers who've not been in a studio before. Keeping tempo is, to me, one of the most important things of the entire band. That doesn't mean, however, that you have to work with a click. Um, a lot of bands, especially younger bands, complain about working with clicks. They find it quite rigid and they lose quite a bit of themselves in there. And that's usually inexperience. Anyone generally in my experience who tells you that you lose feel with a click track hasn't played with a click enough. If you as a drummer have four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks until your studio recording date, start practicing with a click. Maybe a metronome app on your phone, just start playing with it. Even if when you come to the studio, you're not going to use a click with the band, you will find that if you play with a click, you'll notice where you're speeding up and where you're slowing down. And suddenly that will help you to become a smoother drummer, a more fluid drummer, because it's all about that steady tempo, even when you're going crazy, because that's what makes people dance. That's what makes people move. It's what makes people nod their heads. On ballads, that steady tempo is what makes you feel the groove. On the heavy, fast stuff, keeping that tempo means that people can bash their heads about or dance or whatever to a steady rhythm. If you're up and down all over the show, I mean, it, this isn't even because it's like, oh, I would have more editing to do. That's not my point. My point is the more natural we can get the drummers to be a steady beat, the better the song will become. If there's a section where you intentionally speed up to a point or if you change tempo in a track, cool, fine. As long as that's deliberate and planned and you're not just trying to make excuses of, oh, that's how it's supposed to be because non-musicians, they might not know exactly what tempo you're working at, but they can feel it. They can feel a pulse and they can feel when it's pulled round and they don't know why, but they know that it feels amateurish. And that is one of the biggest tips I can give to drummers. This next tip sounds like an obvious one, but it needs to be said. Everybody in the band needs to be absolutely certain which songs you're going to come and record well in advance, and everybody needs to practice them together a lot in advance. Because if you focus on a set number of songs, it might drive you crazy, but you will know very quickly if there's a part in that song where someone's playing something they shouldn't be or that two parts aren't meshing or you might find some other issues like maybe the song's too fast maybe the song's too slow maybe it's in the wrong key if you play it enough and focus on all these details you will know everything before you come into the studio because there's no worse feeling apart from a, a drummer who's in and out of time like Doctor Who um, than getting into the studio recording a take of a song and coming and listening to it back and going that doesn't work, that's not right, because then what you've got to do is try and adapt it live in the studio. You've then got to try and play a song in an entirely new key or tempo or change your parts with no prior warning and no practice, and that's gonna put you on the back foot. And unless you're an insanely talented musician, that's really gonna throw you. And that's not what you want in one of the most important musical points. Arguably of your career, to me, the studio moments that you have are some of the most important because they're the bits that everybody sees for all time. If you play live and improvise something and it's not quite perfect, it's there and it's gone. And it's cool, but it doesn't really matter. Whereas in the studio, if you can't get something, I mean, we can do a few takes, sure, but if you're not getting the change, whatever that change has been, that you should have been talking to the band in the practice room, then that's going to leave you in a difficult position. So make sure everything is properly rehearsed. On that note, my next tip is a bit of a strange one, but give this a try. Try practicing the songs, especially if they're heavy songs, without any distortion at all. Just 
Not because you're going to play the song that way, but you might be surprised, especially in a practice room environment when you've got crashing cymbals and roaring amps, how I've had so many bands in the studio where either the guitarists are playing, trying to play off each other and didn't actually know what they were playing, or the, the most common culprit is a singer, vocalist, who in the practice room has either been making words up or has been dead set on his lyrics and then when it becomes crystal clear in the studio the rest of the band go what are you saying you can't do that oh we couldn't hear that in the practice room we couldn't hear what you were saying well it's a bit late now at the kind of decision time so just try the song with a run through where it might not be the tone that you are going to use but try and run through a song in such a way that everybody can crystal clear everybody else just to run through it and see if you can pick anything out that didn't quite work. It's worth doing just as an exercise so that then at the end of it, if there are any bits you've had to work out because you've had to stop and go, hang on, then when you turn all the gain back up and do it heavy, it should be tight, it should be in tune with each other, it should be locked in because you've then taken that thing that was deafening everybody and masking the situation and at least tried without it. Whilst I'm on the subject of being in the practice room, there's one more piece of advice that I have. While you're preparing for a studio visit, don't just run through the songs and then say, all oh, right, they're fine. Here's a suggestion, record the songs in the practice room, not as a replacement for the studio recording and not even, you don't have to put any technical effort into this. If your phone's capable of recording a band without horribly clipping so you can listen to it back, do that. If not, find something you can record yourselves with that you can just listen back to. Maybe send a copy to everybody in the band. Because then when you've decided this is the structure of the song, the verse goes here, the chorus goes here, this bit goes here, this is it. You then have a solid, finished, this is how we are going to play it. Because there is some room in a studio session for a bit of improvisation to get a bit of kind of mojo or soul in there. But generally speaking, especially in your first couple of studio sessions, your aim should be to translate what you have already written and already made into the best sound it can be to be prepared for the outside world. So you should have everything locked down absolutely to a T so you can listen to that recording of the band then when we've been in the studio they should be practically identical except one sounds amazing and that's what we're here for here's something to think about if you're the singer if you're writing the lyrics um you want your song to be heard by the biggest number of people that's pretty much why we do this right it's uh, to get our word out whether or not you want to be famous you probably want to be appreciated that's music so think about your lyrics um is there a lot of swearing in it um not that i would ever get a band to release the song without any swearing as kind of compromising integrity but have a think about how to do kind of a radio version because it's well understood that if you want to be promoted on radio, they won't in any time other than like past midnight play songs with swearing in them. That's just the way it is. So you have choices. Do you want to bleep out the swear words, leave them in as being obvious? Do you want to mute them out just so that those words aren't there, but you know what it was going to say anyway, but it's then politically correct? Do you want to make another version of that line that's quite acidic, acerbic and really cuts to the point without being an offensive word. I mean, for the version that you're going to release on Spotify or iTunes or whatever, it says explicit next to it, doesn't it? So you can swear all you like. Your words are your words. But if you want a version to go out and be heard by thousands and thousands of people, keep this in mind ahead of time so that you've got some time to think about this, whether you're okay with it, whether there's some alternative wording that you could make that for that small sacrifice only on one platform that's the thing only for radio not for the other platforms will help with the exposure to get you on the airwaves so that people hear about you so that they come to see your show so that you can swear at them all day long 
Another thing for singers is try and think in advance about vocal harmony. So many singers that come in want to do their own backing vocals. They want to fill the song out with extra parts, but they've never stopped and thought about vocal harmonies, how to do them. They just think, oh, I'll do it on the day, it'll be great. Now, an engineer like me that's musically trained can help with vocal harmonies. Of course I can. If someone sings a line, I could probably sing them an alternate line back to make a harmony. Maybe three parts, maybe four parts. I could make it pretty big if that's your goal. But if you have a chance to think about this before the studio, you might decide on a line that's different from what, what, I, what I would have come up with that's very much your own style. And that little bit of preparation if uh, the easiest way to do this is sing the main vocal line into your phone on like voice memo mode or whatever it is and then just that line and hit play and try and sing a harmony with it and then do it over and over and over maybe with your headphones in until you find something that works with it then record that record that separate part as a voice memo so that you then you can come back to it hit play and just listen and sing that back and that will work because when we get to vocal recording it's pretty intense if you're doing several songs, maybe over a few days, you've got a lot to think about. You've got different chords, different lyrics, different vocal lines. So all your harmonies, unless you are classically trained in music theory, uh, they might take you quite a while to work out something you're happy with. Not just work something out, but something where you go, yes, this is me. I mean, great example of a band that I am confident worked out all their vocal harmonies as someone like Alice in Chains, where a lot of their stuff is block harmony. And go and give them a listen or any other band that's got solid vocal harmonies and then think, well, how did they write that? And then, uh, so if they wrote the main vocal first or did they write them together in the room, just have a think and try and prepare so that when you come in, you've got all these ideas in your head and you can just go. You'll be happier with the result because you were confident going in that way you've got more brain space to deal with the technical things of being in a studio like being in a vocal booth not having a crowd and uh, performing kind of as if there was one whilst also being quite technical same with all the the other guys in the band what i'm really saying and to, to conclude this is preparation is key there's only so much that the best studio engineers in the world can do for you if you don't prepare to do what you can for them. Preparation, preparation. It's, it's the absolute... It doesn't cost you anything either. Any of the things that I've suggested, apart from the strings, which is the technical thing, the, the heads, that kind of thing, everything else that I've suggested doesn't cost you anything. You just have to think about it in the right way. So. Hopefully this will help you to become a better musician for the studio, which then means that you've got a recording you can practice to for when you go out live, so it makes you a better musician live. And that step of improvement and improvement of an improvement carries on, because that's what we're after. We as engineers want you to be the best you can be, so you can enjoy a performance, so you can dazzle a crowd, so you don't get nervous or unsure in front of a microphone so that you can do the same thing, take after take after take. It's a good thing um, to mention is guitarists. Rhythm guitarists, generally speaking, when we record rhythm guitars, we will double track rhythm guitars, which means that we'll record the same piece for the left and right channels, and it has to be identical, not copy-paste. You have to play it twice. So if you've prepared, if you know everything, your preparation, that's gonna sound like an absolute monster. If you haven't prepared and you don't know exactly what it is you're supposed to be playing, it becomes very difficult. There are, there are examples on my YouTube channel of me writing a song live on stream and you can see how it's not perfect. It's not tight because I'm coming up with it on the go even when I'm double tracking it. And that's something that I fully acknowledge, but that's when I'm writing. And then what I'm going to do is if I'm going to record something as I would in the studio, I then go away and practice and prepare what I've recorded as that writing demo. Like I said, record in the practice room and that will then stand me in good stead so that when I hit the record button for a serious take, I know exactly what I'm supposed to do and it comes out 
solid. I hope this has really helped you. I look forward to you all either coming to my studio, to the Hot Pole Studios in Ashton Underline, England, or to whichever engineer you are going to go to. A big shout out to the engineers who are going to show this to their clients as well, because this hopefully will apply to any engineer around the world. So share this with anyone who's going to come into your studio. And thanks for watching. I'm Adam Steele for the Hot Pole Studios, and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye. Thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this, feel free to check out our other videos as you can find here, or check out our Facebook and Twitter, or our Patreon page which helps us to make more videos like this. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.